an accident at 70 miles an hour. It was probably the, the worst situation I had ever seen. One biker clings to life. He was just bleeding and had all these IVs everywhere. While his friends cling to a promise. I want you to tell them that Clint will recover all. See his miraculous recovery on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. A Turkish court has sent an American pastor accused of spying back to prison. Andrew Brunson's family, friends, and even President Trump had all hoped he'd be released, but their expectations were dashed after last week's hearing. Here is Gary Lane with the story. It was the third hearing for the 50-year-old North Carolina pastor, and it ended in another disappointment. That's because many people thought Andrew Brunson would be freed from prison. He has spent 20 months behind Turkish bars on accusations that he spied on the government and plotted with rebels to overthrow President Recep Tayyip Erdogan in July 2016. For nearly two hours during the hearing, former church members testified against Pastor Brunson, making vague, unsubstantiated accusations. When the judge asked Brunson to reply to the witnesses, he said, quote, My faith teaches me to forgive, so I forgive those who testified against me. Only one witness from the defense was allowed to testify. The U.S. government expressed concern about the court's decision. I have read the indictment. I have attended three hearings. Uh, I don't believe that there is any indication that Pastor Brunson is guilty of any sort of criminal or terrorist activity. The Trump administration and members of Congress have been pressuring Turkey to release the pastor. On Wednesday, President Trump expressed displeasure, tweeting, a total disgrace that Turkey will not release respected U.S. pastor Andrew Brunson from prison. He's been held hostage far too long. Erdogan should do something to free this wonderful Christian husband and father. He has done nothing wrong and his family needs him. CeCe Heil of the American Center for Law and Justice says immediately after the court decision, the Trump administration and members of Congress began working again diplomatically to help free Brunson. It's a devastating blow. So I would just, you know, pray for encouragement um, for Pastor Brunson and, and for his family because they, they suffer the same. Gary Lane, CBN News. Now, this is a terrible development for Pastor Brunson. Uh, essentially, he's being held as a hostage. Uh, and there's negotiations going on between the government of Turkey. They want the United States to extradite a Muslim cleric who's currently living in Pennsylvania, uh, who was part of that opposition to Erdogan. Uh, and they're trying to silence all the opposition within the country. Since that uh, uh, so-called attempted coup, and there's some question, was there any coup at all, or was it all trumped up? 120,000 Turks have been put into prison uh, in order to silence critics of uh, Erdogan. So we're, we're looking at something that's rapidly turning into a dictatorship and Pastor Brunson is just a hostage in that situation. Well, turning now to Africa, the Boko Haram terror group is still a threat in Nigeria, but recent attacks against Christians there are coming from Muslim tribal herdsmen known as Fulanis. So far this year, the herdsmen have killed 6,000 Christians. Take a look. What we have is a genocide. They are trying to displace the Christians. They're trying to possess their lands and they're trying to impose their religion uh, on the so-called infidels and pagans uh, who they consider Christians to be. According to the Global Terrorism Index, Fulani herdsmen have killed as many as 60,000 people since 2001. And church leaders in Plateau State say, so far this year, the herdsmen have killed 6,000 Christians. Ogebi says by eliminating Christians, this group can dominate North and Central Nigeria politically and economically. Thousands of Christians need help to escape the violence. I know that CBN 700 Club is in Nigeria, um, so if people support uh, CBN, uh, we know that CBN will deliver uh, to the people who are afflicted. Oisamoje says CBN is dispatching humanitarian teams to the affected regions. They recently provided free medical care in north-central Nigeria while sharing much-needed spiritual comfort. I think one of the things we need the most is prayers because, after all, the Bible tells us that we do not war against flesh and blood. 
And so we know that there's spiritual issues. So we need to pray. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, despite the growing violence in Nigeria, here's a reason to remain hopeful. Esther is a Christian in Nigeria who watched Islamic radicals burn her family home. Khadija is a Muslim who experienced the same thing at the hands of Christians. They shared their experience uh, and their, they shared it together and it drew them together and it made them determined to bring peace to their homeland. Esther Ibanga pastors a church in Jos, Nigeria. She remembers the day in 2010 when Islamic militants set fire to her mother's home. It really hurt me because it was like my whole childhood just went in the flames. That same year, less than five miles away in Dogonahawa, more than 500 women and children were slaughtered by Islamic militants. The Christian women leaders in the city began to come to my house and they said to me, Pastor Esther, what should we do? I mean, this cannot go on. Esther says they dried their tears and organized a protest. Thousands of women marched, petitioning the government to end the corruption and violence. Shortly after, women from a nearby Muslim village responded with a march of their own, for women and children killed in an earlier attack by Christian militants. So I decided to reach out to the Muslim woman and I said, listen, you're not my enemy and I'm not your enemy. She called Khadija Hawaja, a Muslim community leader, to come up with a solution. But Esther struggled with giving her own anger and bitterness over to God. And I told the Lord, no, I'm not gonna forgive because I was hurting so much. I just did not want to have anything to do with any Muslim. Then she heard Khadija's story. Her personal house was also set on fire by Christian youths. When she said that, I just stopped right there in my track, you know, because she understood what I felt and I understood what she felt. And we just realized we needed to come together and help these kids. And so that healed me and that brought me to the point of actual forgiveness. It was then they established Women Without Walls Initiative, working to help Muslims and Christians resolve their differences to bring peace to Nigeria. They believe women are natural agents for social and national change because they know the key to transforming Nigeria is to reach the children. The mother school basically is um, raising local women to be the first line of security for their families and their communities. And so we take them through a 10-week training on how to recognize the signs of radicalization in their children. They're also giving at-risk youth scholarships to finish school, offering support for physically challenged students, and helping communities engage in dialogue. But Esther says their message of peace hasn't always been welcome. They said, we don't have drinking water in this community, and you're coming to talk to us about peace. What is peace? So we said to them, okay, if we get you drinking water, will you talk with us? They said, yes. Women Without Walls persuaded an engineering company to dig what they call the Peace Well, a source of clean drinking water shared by Christians and Muslims alike. Through this and other efforts, Esther sees lives being changed. I've had a Muslim boy call me mother. I've had a Muslim boy listen to my tape and just quote my sermon. And he said he can relate to what pastor is saying. So for him to want to see Jesus, to hear Jesus, just through associating with me, I think God is glorified. Esther has been criticized by Christians for partnering with the Muslim community, but she's not quitting anytime soon. She says the stakes are high, and the only way to bring peace is through God's message of hope and love through Jesus Christ. He died for the sins of the whole world. He didn't die for Christians. He died for those Muslims. He died for those unbelievers. God is ready to transform lives if we would let him use us as vessels. Oh, what a wonderful thing and how courageous to reach out to say, you're not my enemy and together we can fix this. We can bring reconciliation. Realize that the Bible is true. Uh, the Bible says when the enemy comes in like the flood, like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard. So the issue is, are you willing to be that standard? Are you willing to be raised up? Well, up next, a biker crashes and just barely clings to life. He was just bleeding and had all these IVs everywhere. And 
He was on a ventilator and he was bleeding out of his ears. The medical community did not expect him to survive. See how this man makes a miraculous comeback right after this. Doctors were not hopeful. Not after Clint Mayfield flew over his motorcycle handlebars at 70 miles an hour. Clint's wife, Andrea, believed faith and hope was all she had, and it was about to be put to the test. During a motorcycle ride near Houston, Texas in June of 2006, Clint Mayfield's leather jacket slipped off the back of his bike and became tangled in the bike's chain, seizing the rear wheel. Clint was thrown over the front of the bike at 70 miles per hour, landing headfirst on the asphalt. Later that night, Clint's wife, Andrea, got a phone call about the accident. I was instantly worried, shocked, and just kind of stunned. I didn't know any details, so it was really it was scary. Emergency responders called for a life flight to a trauma center in Austin, Texas. Clint and Andrea's pastor, Don Norton, was also contacted and drove to the hospital. We were praying as we drove, and uh, I was just trying to, uh, trying to hear the voice of God about the situation because I knew I'd be wa walking into a very difficult situation and wanted to be an encouragement to them. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, when you get to the hospital, I want you to tell them that Clint will recover all. You know, don't, don't worry about what's happened here. Don't look at the situation. Don't look at the circumstances. Uh, don't, don't, uh, don't put too much stock in what the prognosis is. Uh, Clint is gonna recover all. Clint had severely damaged the frontal and temporal lobes of his brain and was in a coma. Doctors said if he survived, he may need full-time care for the rest of his life. He was just bleeding and had all these IVs everywhere. And he was on a ventilator and he was bleeding out of his ears. It was, it was probably the, the worst situation I had ever seen. The medical community did not expect him to survive. Their family gathered in prayer at the hospital, and word went out to their church community to pray for Clint's survival. Whenever we felt like, you know, we needed to, to pray, we would, you know. That's what we needed to do to stay focused and remind ourselves about you know, our promise that he was going to be healed and that we just had to have patience, even though everything looked really bad, to stay hopeful. Despite the prognosis, they continued to wait and pray for a miracle. I know what I know, but I also know that anything's possible with God. They exhibited faith through this entire situation, the likes of which I've rarely seen in 35 years of pastoring. There's just too much prayer going up for him to not come out of this. Andrea clung to the Word of God for hope. Church members gave her cards with Bible verses about God's power to heal and restore. I would read them to myself. I would read them to Clint. I would just kind of whisper them to him in his ear. That would help ground me and bring me back to, that's, I have to hold on. <laughs> You know, that's my answer, or, you know, that's, that's what God's Word says, so I have to believe it. God's Word is true, and that it never comes back void, whatever His promise is. Andrea waited and prayed through days of progress and setbacks. His um, internal cranial pressures would go up, or his blood pressure would get really high, or he um, would have a high fever, you know, things like that, and they were afraid maybe he'd start to have seizures, you know, things like that. Then, you know, it, it would constantly just kind of go up and down, you know, he was doing good, and then, you know, things were getting bad. Finally, after two weeks in a coma, they had a breakthrough. While surrounded by his family, Clint woke up. And he sat up and his eyes got big and he was like, oh, you know, like, I know them. Over the next several months, Clint recovered mentally and physically beyond doctors' expectations, though he says he had to relearn even the simplest of tasks. I don't know if everybody's like this, but you get brain damage and guess what? You might get to grow up again, having to relearn all kinds of things again, like how to do just about everything. 
Clint and Andrea believe his recovery was miraculous and an answer to prayer. You just have to be able to know that God will take care of you, whatever it is. Trust in God with everything. They were just steady, they prayed, they walked in faith, and they received their miracle. And the fact that Clint was able to overcome that kind of a diagnosis, to even be functional as a human being, is just absolutely miraculous, let alone be able to continue his job. Before he was kind of quiet, reserved, didn't really talk much, and now he talks a lot. <laughs> he restored me. I got back everything that I need and more. I got two girls, I got a happy wife. God has helped us to not just move forward, but to prosper. If you just trust him, he'll provide you what you need and more. That's the key, you have to trust him. Hear, hear these words, I mean, you, I'll repeat them. What they did it was they were steady and they walked in faith. And that's the key. Uh, Abraham walked in faith. He's called the father of the faith. Why? Because he didn't consider the deadness of his own body. He said, who has promised is able and he will perform it. Now, how long did it take Abraham? It took 20 years. Uh, that, that's how long from the, the point of time of promise to the birth of Isaac. And he's called laughter for a reason. God wants to bring laughter to you. He wants to stand by his word to perform it, and he will perform it for you. If you need prayer, if you need to reach out in, in agreement with anybody, we're here for you. And all you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. 1-800-700-7000. And regardless the need, realize the number of names for God in the Bible are there for a purpose to let you know that, yes, He is your provider. He is your healer. He is your salvation. He is your righteousness. He is all of these things and more. All you have to do is stand believing and asking. So do it. If you need prayer, call us. 1-800-700-7000. Well, up next, anti-Israel bias in the UN has been an ongoing problem and goes back all the way to 1948. When we come back, we'll ask Israel's ambassador to the UN, Danny Danone, if he believes the tide is turning. So stay with us. Despite hostilities at the United Nations and looming dangers at home, Israel's UN ambassador, Danny Danone, remains hopeful for the future and for achieving peace with their neighbors. It's no secret that the United Nations has long been critical of Israel. The charge has been so common that if you simply go to Google and type in United Nations historical bias, the words against Israel just come up automatically. For instance, the famous political commentator William F. Buckley Jr. said in 1974, the UN had become the most concentrated assembly of anti-Semitism since Hitler's Germany. But the tide may finally be turning, thanks in large part to President Trump and his U.N. ambassador, Nikki Haley. Israel's own ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Danon, recently wrote that since the president took office in 2017, his administration has made clear that blatantly anti-Israel actions at the U.N. will not go without a response. And he wrote, the automatic majority against Israel ingrained for decades in the workings of the United Nations has been cracked. Danon also says that things are different behind the scenes. He says many countries, including some Muslim nations, may oppose Israel publicly at the UN, but privately, they will support them. So despite the UN's past record against Israel, its future may look very different. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, Ambassador Danny Danone jo joins me now, and it's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for having me, Joe. Um, you've... You, You've really got a tough job. I mean, it's like you're going into the enemy's camp on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you how do you face that? What what's your routine to say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in to a hostile environment? Uh, how do you prepare for that? Indeed, it's hostile. You know, I live in New York now with my wife and three children, and it's a warm environment. The city of New York, uh, a large Jewish community, great support for the Christian community. But when I walk from the First Avenue into the UN, it's a, it's a war zone. 
it's a hostile ground. Uh, I believe in what I do. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm by myself in the room, I know that I'm not by myself. I know that I represent millions of Jews and Christians who, who stand with Israel, who support Israel. Uh, so I get my support from coming back to my family, spending time with my kids, and, and knowing that what I'm doing there is for the sake of the Jewish people. Uh, one of the things I really admire about you is you don't just take the status quo and say it's never going to change. You actively work, how can I change this? And one of the things you've come up with, which I think is just wonderfully inventive, is you've got a program now where you're sponsoring trips by UN ambassadors to come to Israel. What, what, what gave you that idea? I'm trying to bring Israel into the UN uh, with culture, art, movies. It's really hard. So I invited ambassadors to come to Israel and we got a delegation of 40 UN ambassadors last mm. April who joined us in our celebration of our 70th anniversary. Mm -hmm. It was remarkable. Most of them had no clue about the history of Israel, about the innovation. And when we walked in the old city of Jerusalem, in the city of David, and we showed them uh, the proof of the connection of Jews and Christians to Jerusalem, they were amazed. So when resolutions come to the UN, where they say that we have no connection to Jerusalem, when the ambassadors actually walk in the old city, they get it, they understand it. That's why it's so important for us to bring as many ambassadors as we can to come and to judge by themselves what's happening in Israel. Why, why do you think there's that ignorance? From, from my point of view, it, you would think UN ambassadors would know the facts behind what, what particularly what they're voting for, but the, the facts behind the existence of Israel. Uh, why do you think they don't know? You have to be in Israel. You have to see it uh, and to understand it. You can, you can support Israel, and we have millions of people who love Israel without being there. But once you, you get into the old city of Jerusalem and, and, and you see what we are doing there, the freedom of religion, people get it. And also the proximity. You know, you speak a lot about Israel here in the media and all around the world. But when you come to Israel, it's a tiny nation. So we took a helicopter a tour, and within 15 minutes, you, you fly from the western part to the eastern part of, of Israel. So to understand the proximity and why we have to defend our small borders. Yeah, I think until you get there, you, you don't understand the dimensions of it. Uh, Golda Meir is famous in, back in 1968, year after the Six Day War. Um, and there was talk of, you know, what do we do with the West Bank? Is it given back? And uh, she said, no, for the first time, I don't have to worry about artillery shells in Tel Aviv. And you don't understand that until you can go and, and you literally see, well, here's where the border is. Uh, and, and hear how close things are. And another thing you, they, they found out that these very are happy people, despite the challenges, despite Hezbollah, Hamas, Iran, you name it, the Israelis are happy. We live a happy life with our families. We invest a lot in our education, in our economy. We are thriving, thing, and we are grateful for that. Why is that? Because I think that's another marvel for the world to see. Here, here's a nation that, that in the middle of all the violence, in the middle of all the terrorism, all the, the neighbors who constantly seem to want to go to war, uh, it's a happy nation. It's an innovative nation. And it's a nation that's reaching out with humanitarian aid around the world. Why, why, why is that? We appreciate what we have. We do not take it for granted. And that's what I teach my children. You know, enjoy life, enjoy Israel, but don't take it for granted. Because for years, our ancestors prayed to live in Israel, to pray. When Israel is being condemned about Jerusalem, it happened at the UN every once in a while, I remind the yeah. ambassadors that uh, it's only 50 years since Jerusalem was uh, reunified, and we are grateful for that. So we don't take it for granted, and now we, we share our knowledge, our innovation with other countries. We are very proud of it. We have in Judaism the term, it's called tikkun olam, that we want to correct the world and to help other nations, and we are very proud of doing that and supporting developing countries with desalination, energy, uh, and other medical devices that can help millions of people. Um, let's go back to the UN ambassadors. What, what do you expose them to when, when they come to Israel on one of your trips? What, what, do, you, what do you show them? So you, you have the regular activities, where it's sightseeing. There's a lot to see in Israel, the history. You go to Masada, you hear the stories of the Bible, and you just open the Bible and, and you read it to them. 
Many of them are Christians, and, and for them it, it's shocking when they, they walk in the old city where Jesus walked, and they understand it. So then they understand that if you deny the connection of Jews to Jerusalem, you deny the connection of Christian to Jerusalem. So it's about themselves, it's not about us anymore. So that, that is very meaningful for them. And I found out that also the issue of technology, that people understand that we have a lot of solutions to their problems. So I will focus on security usually, but the ambassadors will tell me, Danny, let's see more technology. We want to learn about desalination, cybersecurity, what we can bring back to our countries. So it's a combination and it's tough, uh, Gordon, because you have one week and you need to show them everything in a week. Uh, I, I think that's an untold story too. Israel is, is helping underdeveloped nations uh, around the world, primarily with the technology, uh, meeting them at their point of need for both um, power needs, solar power in particular, but also water technology. Uh, and Israel is the world leader in water technology. And then also in how to make uh, unproductive land, productive land to produce enough food uh, to feed people. Um, how did that come to be? Because you don't think of, is, you think of Israel in, in terms of technology, you think of computers and cell phones and all of that. Uh, but there's some real tech, wonderful technology in agriculture and in water. How, how did that happen? It came from necessity. We had uh, no other choices because we had no water. So we developed technology. Take, for example, drip irrigation. We produce it in the Negev, in the southern part of Israel, because there is no water there. And you can now do anything you want in, in the Negev. So the necessity made us think harder, work harder. And today we can share that technology with those developing countries. Uh, and I'm very proud of it. And, and I see the difference also at the UN. Because once you help someone, and you reach to him, one day he will pay back to you. So I feel it now with many African countries that in the past joined the Arab League boycotting Israel. Today we're building bridges with them. All right. Well, that's all the time we have. It was a pleasure having you with Thank us. Thank you very much. All right. Here's a word from the Psalms. May he grant your heart's desire and make all your plans succeed. And that's a wonderful psalm for you, Ambassador. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.